Brothers and sisters, I thank you for, again, this opportunity, particularly for the opportunity to open God's Word. So let's do that. Let's go in God's holy and inspired and fallible and errant Word. Let's go to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, a very familiar psalm, a psalm that I think is both convicting and also encouraging. So let's give our attention to the reading of that psalm. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth, your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled, Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessing of this Word. Now we ask that you would bless the unfolding, the proclamation of this Word for the good of your people and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. A few months ago, about the time that the evacuations from Afghanistan were concluding, uh, Jen Oshman wrote an article entitled, The Americans Staying in Afghanistan. And she begins that article this way. She says, every time President Biden or Press Secretary Jen Psaki talk about the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, they refer to evacuating Americans, quote, who want to leave Afghanistan. And on the surface, that seems like an odd description. Don't all Americans want to leave Afghanistan? Who wants to stay in a place where the Taliban are figuring out what it looks like to rule again? No American wants to stay in a country overrun with terrorists. But there are indeed, she continues, Americans who want to stay in Afghanistan. I don't know how many. I don't know the story of each one. But there are more who want to stay than you might think. Why? Because they love God and they love Afghans. Because they love God and they love Afghans. She continues, these are missionaries who've already counted the cost. They've left home, family, comfort, and security well before the U.S. decided to evacuate. And many have been there since before the U.S. military arrived. They've been all in for years, and they have no intention of coming back now. They will live out their days sharing the love of Jesus in a very dark place. Many Americans are sure that all Americans want to live in America. But many American Christians have answered Jesus' call to go and make disciples of all nations, and they are convinced that Jesus, who has authority over heaven and earth, is with them until the very end. And they believe there is no more worthwhile way to spend their days than to preach Jesus Christ crucified, risen, and coming again to the people of Afghanistan. And they know they're in grave danger. They know they could be martyred, and they believe it is worth it. She continues, if not them, then who? How are Afghans to call the name of the one they have not believed in? And how are they to believe in the one of whom they have not heard? 
And how are they to hear without someone preaching to them? She continues, and she said several years ago, she knew of a young aid worker, a friend of her friend's. And she knew that this young aid worker was killed by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Violence at the time from the, uh, from the Taliban had been increasing in her region. And both her sending agency and the State Department were urging all American aid workers to get out, to leave the country. Her response at that time, please do not make me leave Afghanistan. It will kill me if I have to leave. She intended to give all her remaining days to providing medical relief and the gospel to Afghans. And one day, a Taliban terrorist hid a gun under a fake arm bandage. He entered into the clinic where she and other Christians were providing medical care, and he opened fire, and he killed many of the aid workers, including her. He later would say, he had to. In his words, he said, if they kept doing what they were doing, then the whole country would believe in Jesus. If they kept doing what they were doing, the whole country would believe in Jesus. That's why, brothers and sisters, there are Americans who do not and have not left Afghanistan. And that's why President Biden and Press Secretary Jim Psaki really did have to qualify their statements each time. There really are Christians from America and elsewhere who have hunkered down, who are staying for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation of Afghans. They want the whole country to believe in Jesus. Now, as inspiring and maybe convicting as such stories of people like that young lady are, what in the world do they have to do with Psalm 2? Brothers and sisters, I think everything. Or more pointedly, I think these stories reveal the type of spirit that best understands this psalm. And they reveal the type of spirit that's produced in the hearts of God's people through the proclamation and study and preaching of this psalm. When we come to this psalm, I'm afraid that we oftentimes come to it wrongly or at least inadequately. And this is what I mean. We come to the psalm, and as we do, we've heard a story on on the news, or we know of a situation based on friends who live in another country. We think of an ungodly and an evil government that's doing and threatening terrible things. Right now, I've got a lot of friends in Kiev, Ukraine. And I am thinking about them, and I'm thinking about the Russian troops that are massed over the border. And so I come with that in mind, and I come to a text like this, and it's easy for me to come to a text like this and say, yeah, Putin and the Russians, one day you're going to get it. I can come with that sort of attitude. And it is true that those who hate God and who shake their fist at God will only be allowed to do so for a limited time. There's only a limited time that the Lord God Almighty allows rebels to shake their fist at Him. Where are the Neros and the Caligulas and the Hitlers and the Stalins of the world now? That's certainly a part of Psalm 2. And we'll come to that in, in, in a bit. But if we just come to the psalm with that sort of attitude, that sort of approach that I call the vindictive approach, we don't understand the psalm. That's not what I want us to do. Instead, I I want us to come to this psalm with what I'm calling a self-reflective attitude and perspective. I want us to consider our own hearts first before we move outward. I want to spend most of our time on our own hearts before we spend a little bit of time 
outwardly. And as we do so, and as we're seeking to be self-reflective, I want us to think about three things. First of all, brothers and sisters, I think we need to consider the keys that are needed for understanding this text. Secondly, the knowledge that I think we should obtain from this text. And third, the kiss that's required by the text. The keys, the, the knowledge, and also the kiss. First, the keys. What are the keys the, to, to properly understand and handle Psalm 2. Well, y'all are blessed by being in a faithful church of the Lord Jesus Christ with faithful ministers who've been trained, who proclaim the gospel and teach the scriptures. What a wonderful privilege. Please never forget that. And because you've got that privilege, no doubt you have been to Luke 24 and you know the story, post-resurrection story of the resurrected Jesus meeting those sad disciples on the road to Emmaus. And what does he do? He shows them that all the Old Testament scriptures do what? They point to Jesus, right? And so Psalm 2, in some way, points to Jesus. And that's the great key. But there are two keys, I think, that are actually in the text. And the first one's in verse 1. Verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Psalm 2, joined with Psalm 1, form the introduction to the Psalter. And I think that it's sort of the prelude for the rest of the Psalter. And, and the themes that we find in Psalm 1 and 2 are played out in the rest of the Psalter. And when you compare, when you look at both of those Psalms, you look at Psalm 1 and you recognize it does have a very individual focus. Which way will you choose? The way of the righteous, the, the wise way, or the way of the wicked and unrighteous? The choice is before you. Which congregation will you be a part of? It's, it's a very individualistic sort of psalm. <coughs> Excuse me. Then when you move to Psalm 2, it does have a focus on kings and nations. And that's true. But don't carry that distinction too far. Because what are such nations made up of? The nations are made up of individuals. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? So I think the first key to understanding the message of this psalm is to see that it's not merely addressed to leaders who hate God. It's not merely addressed to nations that are in enmity towards God. It's also about the individuals that are making up such nations. Because we too, dear ones... We too can be drawn into the same vile and profane rage spoken of here. First key. Second key. The second key we find in the imagery of verse 3. The imagery of verse 3. What do the nations and the peoples and the kings and the rulers say? Let us burst their bonds apart. Cast away their cords from us. Now, it might be easy when you hear those words to have in your mind a picture of uh, prisoners of war in chains and shackles, right? Well, that's not exactly the imagery of the words here. The imagery is the imagery of yokes and of bridles and of reins. The, the sort of things that are used with oxen and beasts of burden. The bonds and cords don't so much indicate that a person is a prisoner of war, but actually something or someone owned by another owned, owned by God. So instead of thinking of a cruel military victor with a whip, whipping a bunch of prisoners of war in shackles and chains towards the prisoner of war camp, instead of having that image, have this image in mind. A loving, wise, good farmer getting up early in the morning going to the barn, going to that mule that he has, has loved since it was a newborn, patting the mule on the side and hooking him up to the plow to go out and plow all day. That's the imagery here. It's the imagery of being owned. 
And that is what's being chafed at by the religious leaders, national leaders, those who want to shake their fists at God. Let's burst their bonds apart. Cast away their cords. Let's throw off the yokes. Let's throw off the reins. Let's throw off the bridle. We don't want to be owned. And those two keys then lead us to the second point, the knowledge that we should gain from this text. And this is really a a point of application. The question is simple. Do you ever grumble? Do you ever chafe? Do you ever dislike the fact that God the Creator, He really does own you? He really does have Creator rights over you. He's got sovereign rights over you. That His way should be your ways the ways that you should go, not your own. To ask should be to answer if we're honest. By nature, brothers and sisters, we hate God. By fallen human nature, we hate His anointed. We hate the King. We want to be the King, right? We don't want anyone on the throne of our hearts. We want to be on the throne of our hearts. We want to reign. We want our will to be done. We want to be a law unto ourselves. That's who we are naturally. That's the basic impulse of every fallen human being. One minister was quoting the Scottish writer George MacDonald. And George MacDonald once said that there's one conviction of all those who find themselves in hell. One conviction that they all share. And that conviction is this. I am my own. I am my own. I am my own. Take your nasty yoke off of me. I belong to no one but myself. I am the captain of my own soul. I am the master of my own fate. I will be what I want to be. No one has the right to tell me otherwise. I am my own. The problem is, you aren't. I'm not. We're not. We hate the idea that someone reigns over us or of a king who says, you belong to me. And maybe you're saying, well, preacher Lee or pastor Lee, that's just preacher talk. You know how preachers are. They really get into hyperbole. I don't chafe under the yoke. I don't don't bristle under the idea that God owns me. Really? Really? Well, let's try on a few divine commands. You ready? Honest, be honest with yourself. Turn the other cheek. That includes in traffic. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Don't call someone a fool. Don't commit adultery in your heart. Beware of practicing your righteousness before order others in order to be seen by them. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. You cannot serve both God and money. And try this one on. Don't be anxious about your life. Take the log out of your own eye. Honestly, how are you doing? If your response to any one of those is yes, but, you've made my point. We all naturally chafe under this idea that we are owned. And that leads us to our last point. The kiss required by the text. If denying your natural chafing at the yoke is not the response you should give to King Jesus... If raging against him is most certainly not the response you should give, then what is the proper response? The proper response, we see it in the text, verses 11 through 12. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, virtually every commentator nails it here. Because virtually every commentator says this, there is no refuge from the king, there is only refuge in the king. There's no refuge from God except in God. 
You see, you need him, brothers and sisters. You need to take your refuge in him before it is too late. You always need to take your refuge in him. You need to kiss the sun. But what does it mean to kiss the sun? Well, I think obviously it should mean that we come to Jesus Christ confessing our sins of hating his ownership and wanting to be our own kings. Confessing it, repenting, and having our faith and trust in him. I think it means that. But I think another minister is helpful when he says to kiss the sun basically means four things. It means to obey. It means to accept. It means to adore. And it means to expect. It means to obey. Of course, kissing the son means that we are obeying him as our king. You see, he's not a life coach. He, he is not a consultant who is peddling some advice that you can take or not take. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And how dare we treat him in any other fashion? He's not your life coach. He is your king. Obey him. Secondly, it means that you are to accept what comes from his hands. To kiss the son means that you accept what comes from his hands in your life. And that includes, brothers and sisters, even what we would call the dark providences of life. Those hard things that come into our lives. If we kiss the Son, we recognize He is our King. He knows best. He knows what He's doing. And He's going to ultimately work everything out for our good and His glory. Right? Amen? To kiss the Son means to obey. It means also to accept even hard providences. And it also means, of course, to adore Him. To adore Him. To love Him. Yes, the image of kissing the sun is the image of getting down on our knees and kissing the king's feet. But brothers and sisters, it's still kissing. It's still kissing. It's still an act of adoration and of love. Where is your heart, brothers and sisters? Where is Lee's heart? When we think of all that Christ has done for us, shouldn't we love him and adore him? with all of our hearts above every other person or thing in this world, we should adore him. You remember the story of Jesus going to the house of the Pharisee Simon. And you remember the woman who came in. She knew herself to be a what? A sinner. And she comes in and she weeps and she, she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. She kisses his feet. She anoints him. And you remember as the Pharisee, Simon, is, is looking at that, he's looking at it in disgust, right? How dare this go on? And Jesus turns to him. And Jesus, knowing the thoughts of, the, of his heart, Jesus says the following, Simon... I have something to say to you. Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no what? Kiss. But from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. But she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. She loved much. To kiss the son means you love the son, you adore him. And one more, according to that pastor, you also expect... To kiss the sun means you're coming with expectation in your heart. You're coming before the king. When you rejoice in him with trembling, when you kiss the sun, when you take on his yoke, you can indeed expect great things. You can expect a full and complete and eternal salvation. The old hymn writer John Newton wrote that old great hymn, Come, my soul, thy suit, prepare. And in that great hymn, Newton says this, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever 
Ask what? Too much. None can ask too much. Lord, give the nation of Rhonda to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, that's what we're praying for. Give Pakistan to Jesus Christ. Father, that's what we're praying for. None can ask too much. Obey, accept, love, expect. One last one that I'll add in. Hold out your neck. Hold out your neck. What is the King of Kings? What does Jesus say? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my what? My yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How can it be light? Because, brothers and sisters, when you take on the yoke of Christ, you're being yoked to Christ. And because you're yoked to Christ, he's the one who has taken the load and is taking the load and is doing everything necessary for your complete and full salvation. You're just along for the ride by God's glorious grace. He's the one pulling. He's got the load and he's got it for you, for your complete salvation. From cradle to cross to empty tomb to ascension, to the heavenly throne, to one day coming back again. Everything's being done for his people, for you. So stick out your neck and take the yoke of Christ. And brothers and sisters, when you begin to recognize that, when you begin to recognize there's no refuge from the king, there's only refuge in the king, and oh, what sweet refuge that is, then you are so much closer and I'm so much closer to those Christian brothers and sisters who are staying put in Afghanistan because they love God and they love Afghans. And we're ready for the rest of the psalm. Quickly, what do we see in the rest of the psalm? We see a God who laughs at puny, pathetic potentates who shake their fists at Him. Who vainly are seeking to throw off God's yoke, seeking to throw off his ownership. He laughs at that. You've all probably seen this image before. A little toddler's mad. He's mad at dad. Okay, and he's coming rushing red-faced, and he's flailing around. And dad lovingly sticks his hand out and puts his hand on the head of the little toddler, and the little toddler can't get any closer, and he's just flailing around. And if you're watching that, what are you seeking? What are you about to do? Laugh. It's so humorous. If it weren't for the rebellion in the heart of that little boy, it would be super funny. God laughs. God laughs. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then when you come down to verse 6, imagine this. You're you're typing verse 6 on your computer. You hit the cap locks there. And everything's in capital letters. The entire verse 6 is emphatic. God is saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I've done it. Guess what, you little red-faced rulers? Say what you want to say. It is to no avail because you've already lost. I have set my king on Zion. It is, it is whether you recognize it or not, it is over. It is over. And then the psalmist gives us, not the voice of the Father, but he moves in verse 7, and he gives us the voice of the Son. He gives us the voice of the King. He gives us the voice of the one who's been set on Zion. And what does he say? I will tell the creed the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The king is now declaring that what the father has promised him, what he's promised has been the entirety of the earth. All the nations are his. And again, in essence, he's saying to the red-faced rulers, guess what, guys? You think you're reigning, but I'm the one who's really, truly reigning. 
I am sovereign over all. I am the great king. I am the one in the line of David. I am the anointed one. The Holy Spirit rested upon me at my baptism. And the Father said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I am the anointed one. I am the Messiah. And guess what? In my resurrection and in my ascension, I am now on the heavenly throne in the true Zion. And the Father has vindicated me. And guess what, guys? He's given me all the nations. All the nations belong to me. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Rwanda, USA, they all belong to me. So your time is running out. Your reigns will end. And if you keep on rebelling, my scepter, my rod, will ultimately dash you to pieces. You see, the psalmist is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and whether he recognizes it or not, he's looking forward to the ascended Christ and his glorious reign. And he's also looking forward to a reign that's evidenced by people from every nation coming and kissing the Son. Child of God, behold your King. Behold your King. The psalm is about Him, and He's not a milk toast Jesus. Yes, he's gentle and lowly, but brothers and sisters, he is the righteous warrior king who has been promised the nations and they will be his. So the rage of his enemies is insane, but it's true. It's true rage. And the rage of his enemies is so oftentimes poured out upon whom? His followers, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be it the sneering and silencing tactics of our high-tech oligarchs in the West, or the brutal Taliban in Afghanistan, or the communists who, when they took over China, crucified our brothers and sisters by nailing them to their churches. Dear ones, the psalmists in the Bible, they don't soft-pedal the dangers that are before believers. Yet the psalmist and the Bible don't leave us to despair either. Just the opposite. And as the martyrs through the centuries can attest, the victorious king enables his people to stand in the face of rage. And brothers and sisters, we're going to know more and more and more of that as the years come in this country. Take heart. Your God will not abandon you. He won't leave you, but by His Spirit, He'll bolster you in your hour of need. And even more than that, one day through your efforts, your gospel efforts, the efforts of Back Creek ARP Church, He will use your efforts and the efforts of all of His people to bring men and women, boys and girls, into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to the point that all the nations belong to Jesus. Lift up your eyes. This is your king. Your king reigns. He shall have the nations. But the psalmist doesn't just give you reason to take courage. Lastly, it gives you reason to take action. Verse 10, verse 11, verse 12. Hear them one more time. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Whose voice do we have now? It's the voice of the psalmist. And the psalmist knew that there are leaders and nations and peoples who shake their fist at God, and he doesn't just write them off. He doesn't just say, well, you're going to get it one day. That's it. He warns them, but what else does he do? He he extends this royal offer to them to bend the knee and kiss the feet of Jesus, to find their refuge in Him. And brothers and sisters of Back Creek Church, if the psalmist before the first coming of Christ could extend such a gospel invitation to the nations, what should we do this side of the cross? Shouldn't we warn Afghans, Pakistanis, Rwandans, 
and people of University City and Charlotte and Harrisonburg and Huntersville that unless they kiss the Son by His grace, one day they will face His wrath. Kiss the Son. Come to Him. Take upon yourself His yoke. It's your responsibility to those that you know to proclaim such a Jesus. By God's grace, will you do that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the royal summons that we have now to go forth in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, extending both warning and welcome to sinners to find their refuge in Jesus Christ and in Him alone.